Alrighty. Since it is 11.02, we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, we're so happy to see you all here at our second Leadership Series event. Um, today, we're going to be talking about how to lead a team during COVID, specifically in the office. Um, we have Lisa Laz and Linda Aguilera here to present this. So take it away, ladies. Thank you. Thank you, Brittany. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen real quick. Okay, can everybody see that? All right, we'll go ahead and start with um, introductions. As Brittany said, my name is Lisa Laws and I am the Assistant Director for Residential Operations in Housing Services. My name is Linda Aguilera and I'm the resident, I'm a resident services building manager. Okay. And Linda and I are here to speak to you about how to lead a team during COVID. And as you can see from our picture here, we are figuring this out as we go along. Um, we're not going to present this to you as we are any sort of experts in this matter. Um, our leadership styles, I think, change and adapt as everything around us changes and adapts. So we just kind of want to give that that disclaimer out there. We're just going to share with you what we've learned um, and some different tips and trips that tricks that might help you along the way. So to start with our agenda here, we will tell you about our story in housing, um, what that has looked like, the duration of this pandemic from the start of it until now, challenges that we've faced um, and specific to challenges we faced as leaders in this environment, what we've learned and what we hope will show, um, help you and some resources. And then we hope to open it up to this group at the end so you all can discuss and share what it's been like from a virtual environment. That's something we don't have the experience on, so we want to be sure that others can share, share their experience with. Linda, was there anything you wanted to add there? Okay, so our story in housing services. I think that everyone has felt this way in some form or another, whether it's been at work or at home or just, you know, this whole, these whole past few months have just been crazy. But specifically in housing, as you all likely recall, in March, you know, we had the campus directive that we were going to close for two weeks, um, finals were going to go virtual, and in housing, we naively thought, wow, that's gonna be really great. We're gonna have this time to work on SOPs and manuals. We're gonna get things cleaned up and ready um, so that we're just gonna be so on top of things. And I think at the time we said that is when stuff really started to change. So um, our students, it was right before spring break, so a lot of students just left housing because they were going to go home for spring break anyway. Wasn't going to be a big deal. Well, then not, you know, long after that, the announcement came that instruction for spring would also be online. So that really had our residents make a different decision than they were making when the, the university was going to be closed for two weeks. So we went from having 7,500 residents living with us in housing to about a thousand within a week or two week span. We were not prepared. Um, we usually have move out in June. It's something we plan about a month or two out for. We have stations, we have all kinds of staff working. We're hanging keys, we're pulling envelopes. It's just a well-oiled machine. We were not prepared for what happened with move out um, in March and April. At that same time, we had also, all, um, also been a team of five different offices, 10 career staff members, and 65 student staff. So moving out thousands of people with that staff is doable. We unfortunately had to release our student staff. Um, during that time, they weren't eligible to work in our offices anymore. We had staff who um, had just gotten opportunities on campus where they left for other jobs. We have since had staff who have had the 
great fortune to retire. Um, I think we've all thought about doing that at some point in time in 2020. Um, and then we lost our student staff. So we went down from five offices, 10 career staff members, 65 student staff, to two offices and four career staff men members and zero student staff. It was just a Herculean task that we took on. Um, then what happened as we we're trying to figure out who has left, who turned in keys just to um, turn them in while they left for spring break, it was also a really scary time, right? So early on in the pandemic, we didn't know what all of it meant. You know, we were still working on our buildings before we had to wear masks. So masks hadn't even been implemented yet. We had family members coming just to gather their students and their children because they were scared. Our buildings were really overrun. And um, beside it being emotional, beside it being scary, it was just overwhelming from a workload period. So that, is still something that we joke around about as a team that we're still trying to process because it was it was just so overwhelming as it was then what we had as i said we had students who were leaving for spring break anyway or didn't really know how long this was going to last so we had people that just left we didn't know who they were we didn't know where they went they didn't give us keys. They didn't tell us where they were going. So then we had to do this task of going and keying into every single bedroom that we have in housing to see who still left stuff here, were people still physically here. And it was, it, it was an eerie experience because it felt as if it was kind of apocalyptic, right? So we had these empty buildings. We didn't know where people were lurking or staying. People looked like they just threw their covers off their bed and ran, ran away and we don't know where they went. So now we're trying to figure out what to do with people's stuff. Um, that was a process in and of itself. Um, at that time, I think around that time is when Northern California had, uh, had the shutdown. They shut down first and we had a lot of students who were in Northern California and they said, I can't come down. I can't get my stuff. I don't know what to do. You know, people really left a lot of belongings here. So that was something we had to work through all of spring quarter, um, trying to figure out who was here. And honestly, it's still something we're working through on the campus apartment side. We still have apartments that have belongings in it and we don't have contact with those residents. Um, it's just an interesting dynamic and it's something that we've never had to experience before. So by June, by the time June rolled around, which is our normal move out period, we had closed um, our Aberdeen Inverness and Pentland Hills residence halls. We had consolidated any remaining res hall residents to Lothian, which was just over a hundred or so, um, under 150 students. So we were ready to kind of move out, see what things looked like and a lot of cleanup and we then consolidated down to one office so we now went from two offices we're down to one office um, in june is when our staff were able to retire and they ran out of here as quickly as they could um, to go live their best lives off campus so it was very very different i think summer was probably our most difficult time in just kind of pure exhaustion I should add in there that um, in spring quarter in May, Linda graduated with her master's degree. Um, so as she's trying to navigate, move out and buildings and fear and all this stuff, she's also, you know, completing her um, final exams and graduating. So everybody had their personal life on top of their work life and all of it was just very, very overwhelming. What summer did bring for us since we did um, consolidate to one office was we got to work really closely as a team. And um, that's probably where we, we gained the most experience and knowledge that we'll share with you as far as, far as what we've learned during this. Um, the memes, that's something that just got us through. You know, anytime we could see something funny or silly, and if you just had to laugh, even if it wasn't that funny, just that ridiculous laughing, made it through the day, right? Um, summer, we we just worked, tried to figure things out, and then come September, we had to move new people in. 
and move in during move in in and of itself it's always my favorite time of year it's so exciting we have these 18 year old students who are moving away from home for the first time we have family members that are just so proud and emotional whether they can't believe their child's moving away or they're it's the last baby and they want them out of the house it's just a really exciting fun time COVID really sucked a lot of that out of it. And we as a staff were definitely running thin on energy and enthusiasm. But again, we pulled through and we pulled through. I think what pulled us through is again, the why we're here, why we work at UCR, specifically why we work in housing. And thinking about these students coming to move in, it's a really big deal for them. And it's a really big deal for their families. And we need to give them the best experience they can. So. We all really pushed through September. We had a 12 day work week, um, minimum of working nine, 10, 11 hours each day um, to move in about 700 students into our residence halls and a couple hundred into our campus apartments. It was exhausting. It was fun. It was emotional. Linda took, I think, the prize winning picture um, <laughs> of the of the year of a parent hugging a student we didn't let families into the buildings so students were moving in you know imagine being 18 years old or moving away from home for the first time and you have to go move into the space without your family or friends seeing it they had to stay outside the building um so a lot of emotion i i think is really how i would summarize this period that we've had um now where we're at in housing is we are um, we have students living here for the most part it's turning out to be a really positive experience students are making the best of their experience while they're here um but the busy and the exhaustion hasn't stopped our students uh, on the res hall side are being tested twice a week for covid our campus apartments they're testing weekly right now from the return from thanksgiving break and we have a lot of positive cases um, and then primary contacts to those positive cases. And so we are quarantine and isolating students as needed, um, which is a whole nother experience that is new um, and challenging in, in its ways. So we wanted to share kind of our housing story to give you some sort of a background as to um, the other information that we're gonna share with you. So I'll pass it on to Linda. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm going to be discussing challenges and opportunities that we have encountered. Um, meanwhile, we've been going through all of this COVID madness. Um, so to start it off, the lack of resources. So the last presentation was about building relationships. And there's lots of books on building relationships. Well, there isn't really books on how to navigate a pandemic. Um, so that has made it really hard. Um, or even leading a team, right? There's lots of books on how to lead teams, but it doesn't necessarily apply to our current environment. Same thing for learning from mistakes. I mean, this has never been done and we're going on to what, month number nine? And it still feels like we don't know a whole lot about this virus. Um, you can't look back and say, oh, well, this has been tried before. Let's not do that because it didn't work out. We've been having to take a day at a time um, and learn from our own mistakes day to day. Um, and granted, it, I mean, a pandemic hasn't happened in our lifetime either. So this is the first go around for everybody. Um, learning and understanding where people are, you know, that's a really important key piece of being a leader. And it's different when you're in a pandemic. Um, you're not seeing people, you know, day to day that changes. Um, and it does impact the relationship. Um, you have to try harder and be very intentional from a distance so that it's safe and you maintain healthy. Same thing with building relationships. Um, it does get a little bit more complicated. It's really hard to start from scratch if that relationship wasn't there before. Um, and as I mentioned before, you have to keep a distance to, you know, stay safe. Um, you also, sorry. You want to make sure that you set time aside to check in. Um, don't make it all business, you know, so that the relationship is there. Okay. 
I'm sorry, I need a minute. I can chime in there really quick, Linda, for you. On the building relationships, I think that something that benefited our team is that we were a really strong team before this started. And I think had we not been a strong team, that it would be really difficult to do what we're doing day in and day out without that having already been established. And so the this bullet point under here where it says the pleasurable, memorable, relatable, build trust and loyalty, productive relationship. Linda and I watched the building relationships presentation that the um, leadership series before us had done. And that's such a great point on building relationships and building a team, but it's not something that you can do easily during a pandemic. And um, that was something when Linda and I were talking and um, preparing for this presentation, the presentation before ours, again, was fantastic. It just is difficult to apply in this environment. Um, and especially in this environment, where we are here day in and day out, physically here, physically here with students and families who are nervous and scared. And um, going back to that bullet point that Linda was talking about of learning and understanding where people are. Again, that was something that was brought up in the last um, presentation. Learning and understanding where people are in a pandemic is much more difficult. So as I had stated, you know, Linda was graduating with her master's in spring. I have a nine-year-old son who I'm trying to figure out what on earth virtual school is. Um, we have staff who are preparing for retirement and how do you do that when HR isn't as readily available? Learning where people are is very, very challenging and changes day to day. And um, that's just something we wanted to to highlight um, in comparison to the presentation before and our presentation now. And to add on to that, I mean, you know, not seeing people every day, like I said, it does impact the relationship. So we have to look at different venues for communicating, but also understand what the people on your other end, you know, what are they, what are they open to? Um, you know, do they prefer the Zoom calls? Are they comfortable with the video meetings? Um, or are they preferring, you know, maybe text messages? You know, what is appropriate in you as a leader, but them as your team also to see what they're open to? Um, so trying to understand. So it's kind of going back to the basics, right, of leadership. Um, it's kind of starting from scratch. Um, you know, we're working off of Zoom, we're working, you know, virtually. Um, or even in person, like I mentioned, we have to keep a distance. So it's not like we can gather and, you know, get team meetings going like we used to before. Um, so, you know, we have to let go of what it used to be. And um, so let go of what was and kind of go with what is now, right? So even thinking back to our student training, we currently have student staff now. We're limited to eight and we're limited to a few hours every day, which has been a huge help for us. Um, but even that, we're used to having a two-week training, um, eight to five, and this year it ended up being one day and it was a few hours because we're limited to, and even then our operations changed drastically. Um, so with that, you know, these are challenges, but they're also opportunities for us to really, you know, do better as individuals and as professionals and as leaders. Um, so going on to the next bullet point, you know, being transparent and being or having authenticity and then sharing tough truths. That's really important as leader. Um, but during this pandemic, we've learned that it's good to also keep some things close to the chest. You know, we've been dealing with some very difficult things as Lisa mentioned, not just at work, but personally also. And sometimes as a leader, you know, carrying the load, part of it is keeping some of those things close to the chest, knowing how often things are changing, the uncertainty that's in place also. Um, <clears throat> Sometimes it is good to just keep some things close to you before you know, you know, you don't want to share something, possibly stress your team out, um, and then put them over at edge when you can save them that. So then you carrying that load as a leader. Um, so kind of looking at things in a different perspective, it's still good to be transparent and authentic, but you have to be a little bit more sensitive to the current environment to ensure that as a leader, you're carrying the load for your team um, and being mindful of how you know, certain news can impact them, um, but also being transparent enough to where, you know, your team is on 
the same page. They're realistic on what's happening around us and in the university um, to be able to move forward and be strong together. Okay, and so with that, we did want to also have a piece here about self-care, um, you know, especially being a leader during this pandemic. Um, it's been very stressful. Um, like Lisa said, it's been very overwhelming on top of the emotional um, part of it. So, you know, it's really important that as a leader, you're taking care of yourself and that you're caring for others also. But before you're able to take care of others, you want to make sure that you really are taking care of yourself. Um, so as a reminder, in case uh, you've forgotten what self-care is, it's described as a conscious act one takes in order to promote their own physical, mental, and emotional health. There are many forms that self-care may take. It could be ensuring you get enough sleep or just stepping outside to take a breath of fresh air. For us, it has become coffee breaks, lots of coffee breaks, um, walks. Uh, we have distance dance parties when we can in the office, you know, at a distance, but with good music on, it does really help. Sometimes we have chocolate for breakfast. It's not the healthiest, but sometimes we do what we have to do. Um, we have also have taken on Taco Tuesday or Takeout Tuesday, being in the office to kind of just break away from the norm, you know, bringing lunch and, you know, being in your own little corner. So it's kind of fun to do that sometimes. Um, so it's really important that you take time for yourself, whatever that looks like, do what's best for you. Like, again, we're in a pandemic, so it's really hard. Self-care self before for me was getting my nails done. We can't do that now, <laughs> being shut down again, right? So you know, doing your own nails or reading a book when you have time. And sometimes it really is just doing nothing and that's self-care, right? So make sure you take time for yourself so that you have the energy to take on what comes next, you know, day to day, hour to hour. And it's also important to celebrate the little things. For us, we celebrate testing negative. As staff, we are required or recommended to test weekly. So for us, even though we're taking care of ourselves, there's always that shred of doubt. We never know what happens, especially with our students and having that contact with our students on a daily basis with the services that we provide. So we definitely celebrate the negative test results when they come in. Um, but also celebrating other small things, whether it was, hey, I did my hair today, that's a win, brushing your hair, right? Um, or having good coffee. So making sure that you're taking time to celebrate those little things from afar. As Lisa had mentioned, we like to share memes amongst ourselves. So we also celebrate those um, and take some time to really relax and laugh it out. <clears throat> and then to check in with others, but before you do that, be intentional to check in with yourself too, to, to see if you have the mental capacity to say, hey, how are you doing? Um, it's really important, you know, as a leader to check in with others, but before you do that, check in with yourself to make sure you're in a good headspace, just because our current environment is stressful. It's high emotion. Everyone's dealing with different things at home, whether it's little ones or, you know, work or not working. Um, so making sure that you check in with yourself before doing that. I did include this little picture here about just be, after all, we are human beings and not human doings. I know for us, it's easy to get caught in the day-to-day -day being on campus, um, and we are human doings sometimes. Um, but just remember that we are all just human beings, so be more empathetic in that sense as a leader and understanding that, you know, it's not just work that we have going on. We have families too. Um, understanding that with our current environment, things have changed so much for us as individuals and it's harder to fill our buckets. So being very sensitive to that. Um, so we're human beings, not human doings. And it's okay. It's okay to not be able to do sometimes. Um, so again, being intentional, checking in with yourself, checking in with others, but being mindful of where you are mentally. Um, and it's, it is harder, like I said, to kind of take care of yourself when self-care before looked a little bit different than what it does now, right? So you can go get a massage. So looking at what works um, for you in the current environment. Yeah. So Linda touched on um, some of the things that we've learned from being on campus, um, from physically being here, from being able to work with each other, that's definitely something we don't take for granted. I know a lot of you that are working from home and you don't have that physical interaction with people that I can imagine being very difficult and challenging. 
um, we've been fortunate enough to be here, see each other's eyes, my, you know, minus their mask, but we've been able to physically see each other and that, that has made a world of difference. Um, I know for me personally, being on campus has helped a lot with a lot of the fear um, that people staying at home can have and experience. You know, we have seen that the practices of wearing a mask and washing your hands and staying physically distant, that really can work, you know, we, um, if you put those practices in place and you're intentional with it. Julie had brought that up before we had started the presentation of the idea of when some of you do return to campus and your workspace um, will change, maybe your work hours will change and what that looks like will change. Um, it might feel weird at first, but it, you'll get very used to it. You know, um, you get very used to kind of yelling at each other now because it's hard to hear through the mask <laughs> or um, not understanding what someone's saying and you do this a lot, you know, to make sure you understand. So it, it you will get that. But other things that we've learned um, because we have the blessing of being essential employees, you know, we are, we are here um, no matter how tired we are is that we have lots of grace for one another. So we have to be able to let things roll off our backs. We have to know when someone just really is tired. When, when I first logged in here, Brittany had asked me, she said, how are you? And I said, to be really honest with you, I'm very tired. Um, and being able to be vulnerable, to say that, to say that to your team, to not have judgment in that. Um, I know because I get to physically see my team every day, everyone is doing the best they can. And um, that kind of goes to the next bullet point of things are not the same. What I can tell you is um, we just did our staff evaluations a couple weeks ago and I'm a really great note taker for evaluations every year and I'm really diligent and I have my one-on-ones and I have all my follow-ups. And I was so excited to write the evaluations this year because last year our team was amazing the things our team was doing um we were going to conferences we had all these new ideas linda was going to be our rsbm for the new dundee building and we just had all of these exciting things on the horizon um i have not had one-on-ones with my staff that's not something we have the capacity to do um we are in a very service oriented role right now um, the ability to step away to have meetings, even the ability to step away to do this, um, to do this presentation. It, I, I, you know, we have a lot going on at our front desk still. So we're still a great team, but in a different way. And that's something, you know, I've always had very high expectations. I know Linda could say the same thing for ourselves, for our development, for the development of our team but our roles are different right now. Um, and we haven't lowered our expectations. We've just had to accept the things that we can't change and accept the roles that we're in right now and be okay with that. I think it's still a work in progress. I can't say that you know everyone's 100% there, but things are not the same. Um, and like I said, accept the things that we cannot change because some things just are out of our control. You know, in housing specifically, in June, we had over 3,500 residence hall contracts submitted. And we were like, wow, we are going to be full. That is amazing. How is that possible? Well, by September, it was 700. Um, and that was not because of anything any one of us did. That was because of the circumstances that are well out of our control. Um, adaptability, that more than anything, and I am certain whether you've worked on campus or you're working virtually, that's something all of us have had to exhibit. Um, but especially being a leader, you know, you have to be adaptable. Um, today, one of our staff members had to run out because her daycare had um, a COVID exposure. They said, pick your kid up immediately. So she had, she had to leave. Um, that is just the reality that we have to have. We had um, a staff member who has another job off campus and they've been exposed. So now they are not in the office. We have to close our office early. You know, these are things, again, going back to what our standards were before. It's just not physically possible to do everything the same way we did before. So we have to be adaptable. 
even the jobs that Linda and I are doing now um, are very different than the jobs we had before. Linda is an expert in all things mail and packages. Um, if, you, if you ever have questions about that industry, we, we know that right now because people are ordering um, everything that they can online right now. Um, making it up as we go along. Now, you know, we've all heard that saying like fake it till you make it. Um, we're not even trying to fake it. A lot of times we literally have no idea what we're doing. So um, move in this year, for example, when we had to make that really hard decision that families couldn't go in the buildings. Oh my gosh, what was that going to mean? I mean, that just hurt my heart, hurt everyone's heart that we had to make that decision. But what does that look like? How does that move and go? We have never done anything like that. And for me personally, you know, I've planned several move-ins in my career here at UCR, and I can move in 3,500 people with my eyes closed. 700 people during a pandemic, I don't know that I've ever been more stressed out <laughs> in my career here. Um, so, you know, being honest about that as a leader and really leaning on your team for their ideas, for their suggestions, and trying to figure it out together. Um, I just don't think any leader knows 100% what they're doing in this environment. And in my opinion, I feel like it's okay to say that right now. And the next bullet point of taking, uh, take turns carrying the load. So um, like I said, I'm, I'm so fortunate that our team has was strong before this started. And we were really a great team in, um, playing on each other's strengths. That was something that I think we did really well as a team is there was never any um, jealousy or animosity of, oh, well, why is Linda doing that? Well, Linda's really, really great at that. Let's have Linda do it and let's learn from Linda and let's follow her lead on that. We've now kind of done that in reverse and like, okay, you know, someone on our team is feeling really tired and really overwhelmed and they have a lot going on. What can we take from them to help support them through this? Um, I've had to feel more comfortable as a leader reaching out. I'm somebody that always wanted, if I can do it, then I need to do it. You guys, I'm exhausted. I need help, you know, or I'm working from home on this day because my son is in virtual school and my husband needs a break, so I can't physically be there. I need your help on this. So asking for that help, again, being vulnerable and being okay with that, with no judgment, I think is really important right now. Laugh and focus on the positives. I mean, even I started laughing, when, and maybe it's just because we're tired and delirious, but when Linda said we celebrate a negative COVID test, <laughs> like, when we get those negative COVID results, we do. We send text messages and there's confetti and it's like, woo, we made it another week. Um, and so the laughing, I think, is what has pulled us through. Um, focusing on the positives and, and that is something I truly believe. I mentioned that at the beginning, but I am so grateful that I have been able to stay on campus and work. And I'm so grateful that I've been able to stay on campus and work with the people that I have because I think even as stressful and scary as it has been at times, I think it's really what's pot, you know, pulled us through. So we're grateful for that. And then appreciation, that's something I think that was talked a lot about during the last presentation of tokens of appreciation or um, you know, which, what your love language is, or you know, that's harder, I would imagine now in a virtual environment. But here physically, um, donuts go a long way, you know, bringing a donut and just, sitting there and eating it can mean a lot, you know, um, just those little things that we can do, even if it's just a text or it's an email or whatever that is, um, just to be noticed and acknowledged, especially being an essential employee and being physically here. It's very lonely here. Um, it's very different in our experience. And so just being seen and acknowledged of, I know this is hard and I know you're doing a great job. I think those that we've gotten have gone a long way. And we're really, you know, working in housing. Um, it's a unique experience, but Linda can attest. We have some of the most gracious and kind residents during this time. They have acknowledged the hard work that um, our staff has been doing. They've brought in little tokens of appreciation. 
And that's very kind, right? Because we know our students are college students and they don't always have the resources that maybe we do as career staff members. And so um, that has meant a lot. So those are the things that we have learned by physically being here and by being essential workers. So we don't wanna take the time away from a group that's collected here. We know again that you all working virtually likely have different experiences. So we wanted to be able to give you the opportunity to share um, what you learned about being a leader during COVID. Um, so yeah, however that is, whether that's you turn your mic on or in the chat. I know that uh, speaking for me and my team, like it's it's been a drastically different world virtually. I mean, we we don't see each other um, aside from, of course, on Zoom where, you know, we have weekly teams meetings and our weekly meetings have been a major way for our team to stay connected. Um, and I think it's really helped us kind of through this virtual time. Um, the other thing is still trying to somewhat keep a semblance of, you know, our yearly traditions and stuff. I know right now I'm planning a holiday lunch for next week virtually, so we'll all show up on Zoom with our food, um, but just kind of trying to keep that tradition alive in this virtual world. I know that's some of the stuff that, you know, we've kind of been working on. And I wanted to add, um, so our leader is Paul Richardson. He's on um, on the call here. And he does do, like, I think it was um, Linda who mentioned, don't just keep it all business. He does check in with us. How's the kids? How are your parents doing? So I know that makes a big difference as well. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm an advisor in political science, and um, I think for us, uh, sometimes uh, it feels like it's all work and no play um, in this virtual um, aspect for me. That's how I feel. I feel like we're putting ourselves out there to make sure that students can connect with us um, so that they're not lost, but at the same time, you're, you at the end of the day, you're like, whoa, I did that. I don't know how I got through it, but okay, cool. I'm, I got through it. Now what? Oh, it's five o'clock. So should I do all my administrative stuff? No, I walk away. <laughs> Come back in the morning and try and handle it. But I think also for me, it's um, trying to make sure that I establish like the, the law of the land. This is my personal life and then this is my work life. And, you know, when are those hours? When, when should I stop and I start? Because I, I think even with my coworker, we feel like we know the deadlines are coming. And so we're, you know, trying to fit in a good hour's worth of work in the middle of the night because we couldn't sleep or something like that. And, and it, so it, it's kind of a good, bad thing. I and mean, we're on top of it, but by all, what means did we have, to, what did we have to give up to make sure that we were on top of it? Yeah, I know uh, we've kind of thrown it around a little bit within our team. It's not so much you know, we're working from home, it's that, you know, we live at work. <laughs> and it's so it's like kind of trying to find that separation for sure. Yes. Well, and then considering, you know, as Lisa said, you know, I work full time, I'm doing remote school. And on top of whatever else I take care of for my own personal life. But I still like my remote, or I mean my, uh, my commute. Yeah, I, I definitely empathize with you all that are working from home. I, I usually work from home one day a week. Um, like I said, I give my husband a break who's working at home full time with our son. I am not a fan, personally. Um, and I work from home in my kitchen, so I want to eat everything. And um, that separation, like you said, Christy, of, of work and home life, I would imagine that if that's what you're doing full time, that that's very, very challenging. Um, I definitely like my work 
being here in this physical office and I can focus on what I need to do and then I can be home and, and be mom and wife and everything I need to be there. So that is, I, I definitely empathize with you all on that. Good morning, everybody. I, I wanted to add something. I also think that it's very important for leaders to model what that separation looks like for their employees. Um, there was a, a senior associate dean um, or assistant senior uh, dean who had an out of email reply that I really, really appreciated. And it basically said, I'm out of the office. I'm taking this time to model good and healthy behavior for my staff um, during this time, I'm not going to be responding to email. And I think that showing that kind of vulnerability and also leading through that example can be very, very impactful. So um, although yes, we do want to offer that flexibility and, and we encourage employees to have model this kind of behavior, it really does mean a lot more and has a more significant impact if it is coming from the supervisor and they're, um, they see it being modeled, they feel more comfortable then in separating, you know, their home life from their work life. Cause I think that is, a, it is a great point. I even have struggled um, to find that balance. And I've actually had my family call it to my attention to say, you're working way too much. It's eight o'clock, stop working. So I think that, you know, being able to demonstrate that to your staff is very important. Yeah, that's really good. Um, something I do here in the office with colleagues or also with our student staff is that I ask, what are you doing for yourself? How are you taking care of yourself during this time? Because um, I feel like it's easy in the current environment to forget about that and, you know, between work and school and, you know, being yourself or even family, not being with family, um, it's easy to forget or not take the time. Like I said, it, it doesn't have to be anything really big, but I think also asking and it, it is a form of checking in on them and seeing what they are doing to make sure they are taking care of themselves. Yeah, and I, I just wanted to say I do want to comment on your Zoom meeting audio only with video. That is like so right on that hits home with me. Just so you know. <laughs> I would imagine. Um, I think to piggyback on what Linda was saying with that, she does do a fantastic job of asking people and checking in with them. But even if it's not explicitly, you know, from a virtual standpoint, we, we use Sling for our student scheduling and mes messaging. Um, and I was in there posting something and I saw that Linda had posted, hey, students, just so you know, here's your resources that are on campus, right? So your CAP Center and here's what's available to you. So it doesn't even have to be, you know, a physical ask face-to-face. -face. It's just making sure people know what resources are available to them. And so I thought it was a nice touch in there, um, you know, because some people don't feel comfortable being vulnerable or, you know, talking to you about what's going on, but just saying it's okay and here, here's what's available, I think was very impactful. And we also do that with our student staff. We haven't had them, um, they're on payroll, but we haven't, they haven't worked since March. And we do reach out to them. Like if you guys need anything, at least um, maybe once a month or a quarter, we just check on them just to see how they're doing. If they need anything, they can come to us. Yeah. And going back to what Lisa had mentioned in the beginning about our why, right? Remembering our why and holding that close, I think the students definitely are, you know, one of the big whys. We are all here. Um, so I think for us, we're fortunate enough to have the interactions with them day to day. So I think that has helped us get really feel or be very grounded in our work. Um, as Lisa had mentioned with them and their interactions or even them telling us verbally that they appreciate us or they they're happy to see us because really only other people that they see because of the shutdowns um, I think that has really helped us being on campus and kind of remembering our whys. I did see Diana in the chat um, said I think com compartmentalizing is what's most what most of us have found most difficult, especially those of us that have little ones at home, distance learning, 
balancing home life, et cetera, it's been an adjustment. And I, that's kind of what I hear from everybody as far as the virtual work. Yeah, I don't know. I, I'm that departmentalizing is still a work in progress for me. Um, and it's, and it's a challenge for sure being physically here, working from home. Um, I think Asidra, you had said your family called you out on you working late hours. My, my cell phone doesn't stop, um, because of all these quarantines and isolations till about 10 30 at night when we're done. And my, my husband and son were like, going to throw the phone out the window. <laughs> you know, they just really couldn't take it anymore. So it's, it's hard that these worlds are, are colliding. Um, I'm very interested to see when books do become available and when people jot down their ideas and, and their experiences of what has happened, what resources people will recommend, because I think we're all grasping for those. Um, and I think we're still just trying to figure it out. I, I would love if somebody had a, a uh, book on that right now. I would inhale it. I think one positive thing that's come from all of this is I have felt like the I work I support academic departments. I'm a financial analyst, and I feel like faculty are finding it. They're a little bit more compassionate and understanding how overworked we all are. So I hear that from our faculty see a lot more now where they're like when you can get to this I know your plate is full so I think that's one good thing that's come of all this them understanding our role more and how we support them um, so I appreciate that I do feel valued yeah Diana I think that goes back to the comment of just having grace I think that's our biggest thing that we've learned this whole time. Well, I don't think Linda and I have anything else, but it's been interesting to hear others' perspectives, um, especially working, working from home. Yeah, thank you so much for coming and presenting that to us because, you know, a lot of us do work from home, but at some point we will kind of get into that environment of working back at work and it's going to look totally different than it did pre-COVID of course. Um, I know that we did have a little bit of a raffle to do. Um, we asked Lisa what book she would, uh, that she kind of learned from and it was the Dare to Lead that Julie is now holding up. Uh, and we're going to go ahead and raffle that off to one of you. Um, Julie, are we going to do the um, mail it to them? Yes, so whoever wins will have to, you could private chat me or email me your address so we can mail it out. And the winner is Gladys. She's still on? Should we make this a uh, whoever's here gets it? <laughs> yes, you have to be present to win. <laughs> okay, let's see. Next one is... Albert. <laughs> he always wins everything. <laughs> well, Albert, you won the book. I know I have it myself. I have not gotten all the way through it, um, but I, I do really enjoy it. I need, to finish, whoop, I need to finish that book for sure. Um, and lastly, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, we will be having another leadership series in January. It's going to be on January 12th, again, at 11 to 12. Um, and it's going to be on the importance of onboarding. We're going to hear from Emily McCoy, Yesenia Melker, and Ronestia Hodges. Um, and we hope that all of you can um, come to this. It will be up on the UCR events page. We will be posting it as well as emailing the um, link out to register. Um, so keep an eye out for all of that. So our idea of these series are trying to get the leaders the tools that they need to be a good leader. If you're a current leader and maybe just haven't had the time to um, get those tools, 
in your toolbox or for aspiring leaders who want to be these great leaders. Um, and like we did relationship building, like Lisa mentioned, it might be different right now, but you will eventually need those tools. So um, just, we appreciate everyone attending. We hope that you continue to come to all of these um, awesome the series and thank you. Thank you everyone. And again, thanks, thank you Lisa and Linda for doing this presentation. Bye.